is such a wonderful job of explaining the scripture. I'm just going to read the words as it's printed in the Bible. <laughs> Luke 9, 28 to 36, and you can find, um, if you'd like to follow along, um, in the Pew Bible on either page 69 or 85, depends, um, depending on which one you have. Now, about eight days after these things, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to thee, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. All right, let me tell you, I know I'm standing before Pilgrim and I struggled with this text. We live in a scientific post-digital age and the job of science is to measure and quantify things to show us how they work. So a rainbow, for instance, is not the gods painting the sky, but it is beams of light reflected through water droplets. Science tells us that. But our reliance on science and clear intellectual interpretation, I would argue, has cost us something. Mark Twain once wrote, we have not the reverent feeling for the rainbow that the savage has because we know how it's made. We have lost as much as we have gained by prying into that matter. So when we look at these passages in scripture that deal with mystery or splendor, our modern minds smirk at the impossibility of it all. I mean, dazzling clothes on a mountain top, ancestors appearing and disappearing and such. So often our rational modern minds look with disdain upon those people who we feel are limited by their literal biblical interpretation. But at the same time, we often miss so much of what scripture has to offer by not understanding the poetic power and eloquence, by not understanding the imaginative imagery that is being offered to us in a sacred context. So if you have read anything from Gabriel Garcia Marquis or Isabel Allende or other writers like that, you know that this kind of literary imagining in Latin American uh, literature is often called magical realism literature. So I want you to think about this as kind of a magical realism. So magical realism is about different levels of reality working at the same time. The realms of the real and the unreal make sense 
since the real happens in the fictional, and the fictional is real. Let me give you an example. I love the TV series Black Mirror, right? It is a fictional TV series about the Black Mirror, about our reliance on technology and those little black mirrors we carry in our purses in our hands all the time. So the television show is fictional. But the fact that technology has taken over our lives is real. The disruption it causes to interpersonal relationships is real. The impact on how it distorts our perspective of time and space are real. And so this program points us to some of the imagined social consequences that has a definite impact on how we comprehend our lives. So it is fiction. A lot of it is magical, but it is at the same time speaking to something that is very real. So I would argue this is a theological construct, and I would encourage you to think about the transfiguration in that way. A real magical story that has tremendous theological realities and social consequences. This is a text about our faith. It is not a historic or scientific account. The job of science is to remove the mystery of the world. But the job of faith is to show us the holy mystery hiding everywhere. So let's look at the elements of this text. And let us try to mind what it's trying to tell us about God, the sacred, and Jesus. So it's significant that this narrative follows immediately the questions that Jesus put to his disciples. Who do the crowd say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And then Jesus goes with Peter and John and James up to the mountain to pray. Now, the fact that Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray recalls another time when Jesus had gone to the mountain to pray. And then he returned to, cho to choose the twelve who would help him minister to the crowds. The image of the mountaintop runs through scripture. That place where the human touches the divine. That symbolic place where God is present, where mere mortals can catch a glimpse of the ultimate truth. We have heard this reference to the mountaintop from modern prophets as well. I've been to the mountaintop, said Dr. King. And even people who live in the most urban places knew what he was referring to. Because if we have been mindful, if we have been attentive to our own lives, we have each had our own mountaintop experience. It may have been on a retreat or at the beach or some other holy moment for you where the cares of the world seem to fade away in that holy moment and you got a glimpse of something. Something became so clear. Or maybe for you it was a certain calm or perhaps a certain humbling. And in that moment, we are better to understand who we are and why we are here on this planet. So we've all had some type of mountaintop experience. But what's so powerful about this story is that it's not the tale of just one person's mountaintop experience. It's not the story of just one person's encounter with the holy. Because Jesus was not on the mountain alone. He had three other people with him. So that experience of glory was not solitary. It was a shared experience. The transfiguration doesn't just serve Jesus. But it prepares him to go back to the people and continue his ministry. 
I believe one of the key lessons of this text is that the glory of God is only possible when experienced in community. Our entire biblical text is about community. It's not about the power of the individual. It's about community, the power of community, the saving of a community, God's intervening, intervening in the life of a community. Nobody, not even Jesus, could shine alone. Just think about that for a moment. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't shine alone. It runs counter to our capitalistic, individualist society. But our sacred text points us to saying we can't shine alone. The power of the story is that only when we are together that God's radiance can light each other's lives. Can we see God's radiance? So next, Peter, James, and John see Elijah and Moses talking to Jesus. They see the ancestors of their faith, the ones that represent the law of their faith and the ancient prophecies. And so here, the faith of the past and the faith of the present meet in this holy moment. Now, Jesus needs to encounter Moses and Elijah, the wisdom of the past, the spirit of the past, the lesson of the past to gain the clarity that he needs to do the work that he has to go back to do. For like us, we can only make sense of ourselves if the people who came before us, if their lessons are present with us in our endeavors. Now the disciples seeing this, they want the presence of the past to stay. So they try to build a house for them. Maybe because the present was too uncertain. Their response, let's build a place for the past to live here. Don't we do that? Want to build a place for the past to live here. But the ancestors, whatever they needed to impart to Jesus in that holy moment of recalling the bridges that brought them across, once done, Elijah and Moses disappear into a puff, into a, a cloud of air. I love that, that imagery. The past is so present, and then it's just gone. How often do we want to build places to capture what is past, to prevent us from moving forward? How often do we, like the disciples, entertain ways that would keep us from returning to the people who need what has enlightened us? Perhaps that's why the text says that that cloud that they disappear into overshadows them. And they are terrified. It overshadows them. It could not be captured. Now, Peter and James and John, they had known Jesus for a long time. And since they were willing to leave their livelihoods and follow him, I'm sure they must have obviously thought very highly of this teaching, of this great, remarkable rabbi. They had recently even come to see Jesus as the promised Messiah, the one God had chosen to lead Israel. But still, hey, Jesus was just a guy, just a man, very inspiring teacher, Perhaps a great teacher who might help his people kick the Romans out of power and allow them to flourish again, but a human being to be sure. But then suddenly, together on this mountain, for just a moment, 
They're able to see past Jesus' ordinary humanity. They're able to see past his humanness and see his spirit and find shining the very essence of holiness, the very glory of God. It's interesting that the disciples were content to keep this remarkable experience of seeing who Jesus really is, seeing Jesus in a new light to themselves. They wanted to bask in it. But all it did was create not more light, but a shadow. All it did was block the light. But from this shadowy place appears a voice, the voice of God affirming to them who Jesus is. Don't miss it. God spoke from the shadow, not from the light, from the scary place. Just think about that. God speaking from the place that was terrifying them the most. That's where they heard from God. And God answers the question that Jesus had posed earlier when he said, I've asked you, who do you say that I am? And then the voice of God says, I'll tell you who this is. This is my child. This is my offspring. Indeed, the biblical witness over and over again is that there is a hidden holiness that exists in and with and under ordinary things and ordinary people. Just think about yourselves. A group of ordinary people gather to sing and pray and listen on an ordinary Sunday morning and declare this to be a sacred time set apart. Just some ordinary people. And then later on we take very ordinary things, bread and juice and wine, and say that these are the things that God has chosen to make holy for us so that we might imagine that we could internalize the life and the words of a rebel who came to heal and liberate. We take ordinary things so that we might have an encounter with the holy, so that we might witness some of the mystery of God, so that we might hear the voice of God, that we might be dazzled by really understanding who Christ really is and be transformed as well. Amen.
love of Christ, let us go looking for the light of Christ. May the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, and the justice of God compel you. And join us as we march in celebration into this new Lenten season. Hit it, Joe.